Continuing today with our uh, series about putting the gospel into practice. Uh, as you know, we went through the book of James for a while, and in the book of James, we learned that uh, faith without works is dead. If we say we believe and then don't do anything about it, there's no point to it. We're kidding ourselves. Uh, that's why we've come to this place where we want to talk to some people in the community who are living out the gospel and putting it into practice in different ways. Um, we've had a few other people. We had Dee Dee Clement, uh, the du executive director of Lowe's and Fish's ministry, um, and she talked to us uh, about the kind of things that she does personally rather than just the things that she does professionally, uh, which was very interesting to hear about somebody in professional ministry and the difficulties of, um, of making that happen on a daily basis in your own personal life. We, last week, we talked uh, with Kunrad Brunt, um, who was a South African who's lived in America now for about 10 years. Um, and he talked about the difficulties of, of leaving his homeland, not knowing where he was going like Abraham, and the difficulty of, of following God where he felt like he was called, but where things didn't seem to work out. We also last week talked with my mother, of course, and uh, she talked about the difficulties that she's faced uh, with her brain injury, uh, losing a lot of the abilities uh, that she's had th through her professional life, and learning to follow Jesus in a new stage where she's not able to do all of the things she used to do. Today, we have another special guest with us from our community. Uh, that's Alan Donald, who is uh, the director of New Creations Inn. If you know New Creations Inn, it's out there by the E-Free Church uh, with the sign that says, this is not a motel. So that's a, it's a great place. Um, if you don't know about it, I'll tell you just a little bit about it. Um, it's a transitional housing program uh, which means it's a place for people who are in recovery. They like to say, we're all in recovery from something. Uh, so it's not a place where people are judged for their previous lifestyles, but a place where they're helped uh, to come to a new place uh, you know, by following Jesus. We come to the book of Second Timothy. And Second Timothy, this is a passage that Alan had uh, asked that we talk about. Um, Second Timothy is uh, a book that Paul wrote to a young pastor, to a, a, a young man who was um, just growing up in the faith and, and becoming a pastor. Uh, of course, there's the letter of First Timothy, and in First Timothy, Paul is encouraging him to not let anyone look down upon him because he's young that he could still lead a church even though he might be younger than a lot of the people who were in it. Um, so that's the context of, of 2 Timothy and uh, 1 Timothy. In 2 Timothy, Paul writes to him again saying that this is a, um, he, he talks to him in a bit more detail about what following Jesus can look like. What we find in the book of in this passage we're going to read in a minute, is that, um, is that uh, relationship comes before responsibility, if that makes sense. What we'll find is that the relationship we have with God always comes before the requirements that God gives us. We find this again and again. If we go back to the Ten Commandments, for example, we learn that God says, I am the one who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Therefore, you should have no other gods before me. So he's establishing the relationship. And then, and then, only then, does he tell them how to maintain that relationship. It's an important point because we tend to think Christianity is about rules to follow to get right with God. That's putting everything on its head. That's putting these rules before the relationship. But nothing we can do will earn God's favor. It doesn't matter how great of a person we are, that doesn't make us acceptable to God. 
All that makes us acceptable to God is our relationship to Jesus Christ. So that's what we find here in 2 Timothy. We're going to read from uh, verse 8 to 13 and then 22 to 26. This is what Paul says to Timothy. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they may uh, also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, he will also, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. And we'll skip down to verse 22. Paul says this to Timothy, So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies, for you know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. So we have a couple different things happening in these two sections that I read. The first is Paul talking to Timothy, reminding him of the gospel. Right? So he says, remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead, the offspring of David as preached in my gospel. This is Paul's version of what the gospel is. Jesus Christ, the one who was raised from the dead, the offspring of David. Now that should clue us in that Paul is talking about the true Messiah, right? The one descendant of David, the one that the Jewish people had been expecting to save Israel from all of their troubles. Paul is saying this is who Jesus is. But not only that, I am suffering for this gospel. He, I am bound in chains as a criminal. Paul is in prison because of the gospel. But the word of God is not bound. It's interesting. So Paul is saying, this is my gospel that I preached. But you know what? Even though I'm in chains, the word of God is not. The word of God will go forth even though I'm in prison. Therefore, because the word of God is not bound, I will endure everything for the sake of of the elect. Those that God is in a relationship, I, Paul would do anything for them. He would suffer any price. He would suffer for them that they may obtain salvation that is in Christ and live with him eternally. So we see what Paul is, is saying to Timothy that this is, he's in a terrible situation, but in a sense he doesn't mind because the word of God will go on with or without him. He'll go through any trouble to make sure the word of God goes forth. And then he quotes this, uh, this saying that must have grown up uh, around the earliest times of Christianity. This saying is, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. Paul is saying this is, a, th this is the gospel, right? If we die with Christ, we will live with him. We must participate in Christ's death. Jesus talks about taking up our cross to follow him. This is what Paul is saying. We must die with him if we want to live with him. And if we endure in our faith, we will also reign with him. Paul's going all the way back to Genesis. Remember where God made Adam and Eve in his image to rule with him. And this is what Christ promises in his new kingdom, that we would also rule with him. But if we deny him, he will deny us. If we don't have a relationship with God, he won't have one with us. Nevertheless, that's not to say that if we make a mistake, everything is thrown out the window, that God doesn't like us anymore. It says if we are faithless, he is faithful. God is always faithful. 
So you see, we get back to this, uh, this relationship and these rules, okay? The relationship, if we deny him, if we don't have a relationship, well, that's it. He doesn't have a relationship with us. That's pretty simple, right? The gospel is get right with God in this relationship. That doesn't mean you're going to be a perfect person. That doesn't mean you have to be perfect before you can have a relationship with him. That's why he says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. When we make mistakes, God is still faithful. God will keep his promise to save us because he cannot deny himself. What does that mean? What Paul is saying is that God sends his spirit to live with us, right? The Spirit is the one empowering us. God won't deny His own Spirit. If we have that relationship with God and God is living with us, He can't deny Himself. God will be faithful no matter what happens in our lives, no matter what mistakes we make. So now we come to the, the part where he's, he's giving the practical teachings. Based on this big theology, Paul is saying, where does the rubber meet the road for you uh, a young man who's learning to be a pastor. He says, flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. So you're a young man, but don't act like one. Right? You need to grow up. You need to be mature. Christian faith is not about celebrating youth. It's about growing up into maturity, pursuing righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Basically, don't live for yourself, Timothy. If you want to be a suitable workman for Jesus Christ, you cannot live for yourself. That doesn't work. That's what youthful passions are all about, right? Is discovering who we are and having fun with who we are. But Paul is saying, go away from that. Pursue what is godly. Faith. Being faithful to God. Loving one another and peacemaking. He picks up this peacemaking and makes this kind of the main point. He says, have nothing to do with foolish and ignorant controversies. You know, when you get into an argument with someone over a silly, stupid point, this happens to everybody at some point. I, I always think of going to my grandparents' house when I was a kid, and they'd remember some memory, and then it would be like, what was on that side of the road? No, it was on that side of the road. Or was that in that town or in that town? And the detail of the story was always the part that they started arguing about. It's like, I don't care what town it was in, just what's the point of the story, right? What Paul is saying is, if we get stuck in our relationships on these little uh, controversies, these little quarrels we have about minor details, we're losing the point, right? We need to keep the big picture in sight. The Lord's servant needs to not be quarrelsome, not looking for fights. Even if somebody tells us we're wrong, um, I, th I think about, you know, I like to think that politics and religion are two places where everybody already knows everything, right? You know, and I think about the president and how many advisors he must have to, t to even just keep him up to date on what's happening in America and around the world. I mean, no one person can actually run a nation in this modern world. No one can have any sense of what's actually going on. They read news stories and report to him. And what is the president going to do in those situations? Uh, you know, we, we like to think we know what he should do, even though we have a, this amount of information. We want to think that we know everything and we quarrel about it. But the Lord's servant must not do that. When you go to the president or to someone who uh, sort of has that power or that authority and, you know, you tell it like it is to them, what is their response going to be? Laughing at you like, oh, you ignorant so-and-so, you haven't done all the research I have, you don't have all these advisors, you don't know what I know. Well, a good leader is not going to do that, Paul says. He's going to patiently listen to what you have to say. He's not going to fight. I'm going to thank you for your input. Maybe ignore it, but you're still going to act in love. That's what the Lord's servant must be like. 
the Lord's servant must also be able to teach and endure evil. He must correct his opponents with gentleness. This is a major point, right? Correction, correction with gentleness. This is what the Christian life is about. The Christian life is about growing up in faith, walking closer with Jesus, and that means being corrected, right? We've talked about other, other terms for that. It might be discipline, discipleship, accountability, or correction. All of these things are someone else telling us that we're not doing things quite the way we could. It's not something any of us naturally want to do. But if we want to grow and be mature, the only way to do that is to be corrected when we make mistakes. So when Timothy's going to do this to people, he has to correct people. I mean, Paul says, God might grant them repentance leading to knowledge of the truth. And people might come to their senses and escape from the snares of the devil. You have to correct people. This is your job as a pastor, to tell people when they're making mistakes, to lead them on the path of Jesus. But how are you going to do that? Paul says, with gentleness. See, the Christian life, and this isn't just for pastors, right? Although Timothy is going to be a pastor, this is for all of us. If you desire to be mature in faith, we have to stand correction. We have to allow ourselves to be corrected, to forgive one another. And Paul's last point then is that by being corrected, that's how we grow up. But we also escape the snares of the devil. Now the devil, the diabolos, that, that word means something thrown in between, like a wedge that breaks relationships up. That's what the job of the devil is, is someone who breaks relationships by causing fights, by causing division. If that's what's running our life, these quarrels, then we're in the snare of the devil, of the evil one that we pray to Jesus in the Lord's Prayer to be delivered from. Quarreling, we might think, is a little thing. We might think it's not a big deal, but Paul is saying this is at the heart of it. So what do we do with this? How do we apply this teaching to life? The question is, do we live out the gospel by seeking correction? Do we look to be guided and helped in growing in maturity and righteousness and faith and love and peace? Or do we try to go it alone? Do we think that as Christians, we have this belief system. I acknowledge as a fact that there is a God out there somewhere. And he's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Great. I've checked off the boxes of belief. I get to the get out of hell free card when I die. And that's about it. Well, that's not what Paul's talking about. If you want to be a follower of Jesus, you need to be corrected. Belief in God is meaningless if there's no action comes out of it. If your life isn't any different, you don't actually believe in God, you just acknowledge it. I know that there are some here who cannot examine themselves properly. M many of us go through these stages in our lives. We deceive ourselves. We think that we're decent people. We don't need to be forgiven for anything, really. We're all right. That is the greatest snare of the devil thinking that we're fine. We don't need any help. We don't need anyone. We don't need correction, certainly. That's what Paul's message to Timothy is. There's always room to grow. And if you want to know how to do that, you have to do it together. Correction always involves more than one person, right? Now, Alan, uh, I'll ask him to come up now. Alan, our guest uh, that I'm going to interview really quick, is... Uh, as I said, the director of a community that puts all of this into practice. Alan knows quite a lot about correction and discipline and guidance. He knows a lot about avoiding quarrels and about gentleness. Uh, Alan is one of the most gentle people I've ever met in many ways. Um, and so I thought it would be good to ask him uh, what it looks like to put the gospel into practice 
where he works and in his own personal life. So let me just uh, ask you a few questions here. So tell us uh, a little bit about your story about how you came to Canyon City. Well, uh, we, uh, my wife and I were both uh, raised overseas, so we came from, from overseas and we live, we're living in Chicago and uh, we knew we wanted to live life on mission. We knew we wanted to be involved in missions and we, th we thought that would look like us going overseas at some point and, uh, and so we came here for some training and for some ministry experience here at New Creations and so we really came to Canyon for the for that experience, yeah. And you didn't leave. <laughs> and we didn't leave, nine years later, so. <laughs> so would it be fair to call you a missionary here in Canyon City? You're, you're not from, I should say, Alan is not uh, from the States. He's actually a UK citizen who grew up in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. So do you think of yourself as a missionary? Yeah, I may have fooled you because I speak English better than I know it does. Um, <laughs> with, with our... <laughs> um, do I consider myself a missionary? You know, that is a, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I embrace that term because, um, because I want to live life on mission. But I'm hesitant to use the term because I think sometimes Christians can easily kind of use that to subcontract mission out to some professional <laughs> somewhere else in the world or even some professional here at home, you know, uh, they're the ones who do the ministry, they're the ones who live life on mission, but the, the calling of the gospel is that um, when we're reconciled to God, we become uh, ministers of reconciliation. So, um, and I know that this church embraces the priesthood of all believers, and so um, in, in a sense, yes, I'm a missionary, and in a sense, yes, all Christians are missionaries too, so. Great, thank you. Um, so, tell me a little bit about what New Creations in is and is like? So it, I think practically, um, so practically New Creations in is uh, we, we embrace people to come live with us for one to two years and we do lots of training and we do lots of uh, teaching and um, we, we do life alongside each other and we work on some big goals and a, a lot of things are accomplished in that year and so um, that could be, you know, um, uh, people going into remission from substance use or, or mental health issues or, or um, recovering from a divorce or recovering from some other life crisis and, or finding a job and uh, entering the workforce again and um, really making these huge goals, um, seeing these huge goals come to reality in the year. But I think in a, in a more um, spiritual sense, New Creations Zen is about sanctification. It's about people becoming more and more like Jesus. And um, we believe that change in people's lives happens because of a relationship with Jesus and that that relationship with Jesus best grows in community, in a community that's willing to correct gently, that's able to teach, that's able to patiently endure with my mess. And so that, um, that happens at New Creations in all the time, but I think that that's nothing special really. That's what, that's what the church ought to be doing um, as well that we should be walking with one another and patiently enduring with each other's messes and correcting with gentleness and being able to teach. And so I think this passage sums up what we do very well. And the end result is God may perhaps grant repentance and uh, rescue people from being ensnared to the devil. So that's, that's our hope. And we, we like to think that, um, that there are big sins and little sins, right? And what's interesting at New Creations Inn is, as I said, they say we're all in recovery from something. So what is that like? Um, how do you see that happening, that there might be people there with what we might classically think as, as really big sins and really big slavery, but also people who maybe are more normal as we might consider it? You know, these different grades of sin. How is that living together in community? And how does the community understand that? Well, I think... I think that's a, what you just described is like an anti-gospel, you know, that I don't, um, my mess is somehow not as messy as someone else's mess. And, and that is going to only serve me towards a workspace salvation, right? That I'm not as messy as someone else, so I can feel better about myself. And, and that's going to diminish my own um, responsibility. Whereas if we come from this 
uh, posture, which really is the gospel. We are all uh, sinners. We are all broken. Um, if I come with that posture, then that actually just levels the playing field. And, um, and in community, that's, that's very powerful because it actually allows me to confess and repent and work on my own stuff instead of um, looking at someone else's mess. Does that help? Yeah, it's good. And so that's what New Creations is like, sort of as a community. But how is that work with you personally in terms of you know you have the professional side where you know you're kind of a, a pastor or a, to correct people um, but what's that what does that look like when you're not at new creations in so um, when I'm not at new creations and I think that obviously the, these values are gospel values these value are, are biblical Christian values that I embrace personally and so um, so that can that can sometimes merge and be a little bit messy, personal and professional. But I mean, totally outside of NCI, absolutely. I um, some of the best teaching moments that I experience are when somebody is sitting across from me at coffee and they're looking me in the eyeball and, <laughs> and telling me, "Alan, you're you're you know you need to repent of that um, that kind of correction." That's very personal, and so that's really what we're doing at NCI. But that's what I need personally, and then. Um, so I think, you know, I was back to the missionary thing, I, you know, I sometimes get nervous about this um, sending and going distinction, so we're senders, they're going to go do the ministry, you know. Um, I think, so not only are we as believers, and me personally, not only am I being um, a teacher, but I'm also being taught. Not only am I um, correcting, but I'm also being corrected. Um, not only am I discipling somebody, but I'm also... Um, being discipled and so that is interwoven deeply into my life and it's amazing how God will use um, each you know each part of your life to um, to help you with the, with the other part and it's all integrated now so there's um, as a someone in full-time ministry I think that the thinking is well it's it's easy for someone like you or me to talk about doing ministry because we're kind of paid to do it um, and we're young and we're able to, to do things that many here wouldn't consider doing. So what do you think putting the gospel into practice looks like for someone who's retired or older? I know that there have been clients at NCI who are also of you know, retirement age and things. So how does that look? Yeah, so um, I think that what, what's so beautiful about... Um the gospel is, is there's equal access, right? <laughs> there's equal access to the gospel. And so he entrusts you with this precious gift of the gospel. And so um, what's been so amazing is the person who came to us who was addicted and came straight from jail and had mental illness is now discipling someone that they um, met through their work. And they're, they're coming back and they're praying. Well, we just studied, you know, we've done three weeks of this discipleship course. So now I can do week one with this person I just met. And so there's just this immediate turnaround of being able to invest. But in terms of retired people, maybe disabled people, maybe um, you know, people who, who maybe kind of maybe feel like, oh, my life's over, I'm, I'm, I'm done now, I've done my bit. Um, I think some of the most profound ministry has happened by God using the gift of time that retired people have, the gift of um, the wisdom that comes <laughs> with those years. Um, we, and I'll give an example, we have a volunteer who's been really faithful at New Creations for probably seven years, and um, he retired early, he was dying of cancer, he, he ended up um, young, retired, retired, retired young, and was concerned that his health was going to be a barrier, and he faithfully comes, and um, it was, it's, it's nothing, um, it's nothing sophisticated, he comes and he brings a book with him and he, and he ha hangs out, in um, the living room and and gradually you know i would see the residents kind of go in there and be like oh someone's in here i'm out of here you know and then um the next kind of the next time um you know the next week he was there they would go in and, and then you kind of see them they would make an excuse to go in there you know like i need to go wash a dish or something <laughs> and they, it's actually because they wanted to talk to him and so he's had some really profound ministry and now those relationships are formed um, and powerful and i i think too about um, you know, this church is invested with loaves and fishes in, in a really powerful way. And it's not just about sending a check and subcontracting our ministry to loaves and fishes. It's about turning up on a Monday night and getting to know people and building relationships and realizing that, well, these people are messy, but 
that actually their mess is not as scary as I once thought it might have been. And, um, and then embracing our own mess, our own sin, and uh, using our testimony to, uh, to, to be a blessing to others. Thank you. Um, what we're going to do is, um, like we've gone to Loaves and Fishes, uh, we've had a Thursday prayer time that's met in our chapel for um, over a year now, a year and a half. Uh, what we're going to start doing is actually taking that time every Thursday at noon to New Creations Inn. So we can do just that sort of thing. So if you'd like to join us, uh, if you have Thursdays at noon uh, off, you can come and join us at New Creations Inn. I'll be there every Thursday. And I know Lois will be there a lot of times, and Levon will be there a lot of times. And we'll just go through the, the prayer that we've set up. Um, it's very structured. It's easy. You don't have to think of things on the spot. It's, it's pretty low-key. But that's a way for us to get to know people and reach out to them and pray for them. Uh, it, you know, and all, all it will really take is just sitting there and, and saying the words in a booklet. But that can have an immense impact. Well, let's, uh, let's thank Alan for joining us. And uh, after the service, I'm sure he'd be glad to hear the blessings you have for his, um, for his ministry there. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the good service you're doing um, through new creations in. We thank you for your gospel that corrects us, uh, that you have sent your spirit to be in us, a spirit of truth, a truth that reveals the dark places, the places that we want to keep hidden, that we're scared people will find out about. And Father, we want to confess that that we don't want your gospel most of the time. We like the sound of a free gift, but the price of the truth is, is too intimidating and high. So, Lord, we ask that you would overcome our reluctance to be vulnerable, our reluctance to, uh, to look like we have it all together, and, and that, that we could give up our image of success and perfection so that we could grow into your servants. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.